Long before the Tokyo Raid, in fact, long before World War II, a little boy named Jimmy Doolittle came down with an incurable case of flying fever. In 1909, they held the first air show west of St. Louis. I went out there as a kid to watch the airplanes fly and became very intrigued with them. A little after that, in popular mechanics, there were instructions on how to build a glider. And so I built a glider. There was a little cliff not far from our house, about 10, 15, well, about 15 feet high. And I uh, thought the best way to try out this glider would be to jump off the cliff, which wasn't well advised because the tail of the glider hit the edge of the cliff and I came straight down, <laughs> broke up the glider. But a friend of mine had a very lenient father who let him drive his car once in a while. And so I tied a rope onto the end of the car, back bumper, and he increased his speed and I ran as fast as I could, finally leaping into the air <clears throat> and the glider again came down and rolled up into a ball. About this time I didn't have enough pieces, bits and pieces to make a, mono, a, a biplane so I made a little monoplane glider, and then I got the idea of putting a pair of bicycle wheels on it. And then I began saving up for a motorcycle engine, and I was going to have me an airplane. A wind storm came along <coughs> and uh, blew the glider over the back fence and rolled it up in a ball. It seemed to me that somebody was trying to tell me something. And so that was the end of my aviation experiences until World War I. Were you crazy? What kind of a person jumps off a 15-foot high precipice within a, in a glider? Hang glider. What kind of a person does that? Uh, I, I agree with you entirely. Uh, it wasn't an intelligent person. <laughs> Doolittle joined the fledgling Army Air Corps in World War I. After six hours of lessons, they made him a flight instructor. By the end of the war, thousands of other young soldiers had caught the aviation bug. A national love affair had begun. Experimental pilots tried anything that looked like it could fly, with one common purpose, to break records. Speed records, endurance records, distance records. And without intending to, these backyard inventors created a new means of transportation practically from scratch. Jimmy Doolittle attacked these new challenges with characteristics that were to mark his entire life. A combination of fearless ambition and meticulous planning. To make the airplane do the things that had never been done before, he studied the new science of aviation and became a second person ever to get a doctorate in aeronautics from MIT. These were people who built their own airplanes, their own concepts, their own designs, their own engineering. The average man in the street could relate to that and did so. Each person felt that they were in that cockpit with Jimmy Doolittle or they were doing it instead of him. They were American public heroes. You've got to remember in those times there were not a lot of airports around. There weren't a lot of airplanes in the air. Particularly out in the country, it was rare to see an airplane. So the one did. They stopped the plowing and you looked up and you watched it. A lot of people today don't realize what fares meant in the small towns and of, of, of America. And one of the things that would happen that everybody loved was to have somebody get out on a wing and stand on their hands and so forth. Of course, on that kind of business, Doolittle was right at home because he wasn't happy unless he was risking something. There's no doubt that he was a daredevil. He risked his neck doing acrobatics, doing crazy stunts, like riding between the wheels of an airplane when Mr. DeMille was making a film. 
America was thrilled by the exploits of Doolittle and the other daredevils, who seemed immune to fear, who laughed at danger, who tried anything and everything, whatever the risk. idea of fun of course as he points out sometimes uh, in his notes and so forth i was a mischief maker he admits and i had good clean fun well his idea of good clean fun would not be yours and mine uh, diving down on three soldiers to scare them uh skimming right over their heads uh they waved and he's uh, upset because he didn't scare them enough so he kind of does it again this time a soldier falls flat in his face he thinks he's killed him he lands nearby, runs over, and finds the soldier is, is all right. Now, that's, that's irresponsible, but a minute or two before, he was teaching students, and he was a very tough instructor, a very strict disciplinarian. So how do you put these two together? When I was coming in to land with a student, and another plane flew across in front of me and uh, took my landing gear off. Unfortunately, my prop took his head off. So uh, I had a student, and uh, we came in and crash landed with no landing gear, nobody hurt. And uh, I uh, got a, a considerable amount of criticism because I took the student right up again in another plane. And about half the people said that's the wrong thing to do, and the other half the people went along with me and said it was the right thing to do. And get it out of his mind as quickly as possible by having him think of other things. Jimmy was one of those extreme drive type human beings of go, 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 push, 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 the ultimate, always the ultimate, never settle for second. There is no such thing as second to a man like uh, Jimmy Doolittle. If the wings came off, as they did occasionally, uh, there's no time to be frightened, there's no time to be thrilled, there's no time to do anything except the things that you have to do damn fast to survive. They humorously called me the master of the calculated risk because I, I calculated each risk in order to determine what it was and minimize the, the likelihood of destruction. Your best laid plans sometimes went awry, did they not? Uh, Yes, quite frequently. <laughs> but uh, How many after, you've given, after you've given it your best, after you've given it a good think <laughs> and done your very you best, best yeah. if it goes awry, why well, you still have a certain amount of satisfaction. He didn't have instruments yet, but he somehow got lost uh, in the fog and knew he had to land because he's running out of fuel. He found two trees uh, and landed right in the center so that the trees caught his wings and this took the whole impact of the crash. So he didn't get hurt. So you know, he'd, he'd figure these things out. Hmm. How many airplanes you figure you busted up in your life? Uh, I've saved my life three times by jumping in a chute. I've landed wrecked airplanes three times and got uh, bunged up, but uh, uh, not badly. Without a doubt, the most daring man in the whole aviation world. Falling more than two miles. Without... Getting out of dangerous situations alive was Jimmy Doolittle's racing trademark. But there was one race and one particular airplane that tested Doolittle the flyer, Doolittle the daredevil, 
and Doolittle, the aeronautical engineer, to the very limit. The year was 1932. It was thrilling. It was exciting. I mean, it was like Barnum and Bailey at a hundred times over. People came from all over, and there was something like 250,000 people. Did you ever see pictures of the stands at Cleveland? Unbelievable. They were huge. People were everywhere, in trees. But that place was jammed. Little communities would set up their own little grandstands and have a picnic. This is the event we've all been waiting for, the Thompson Trophy Race here at the National Air Races in Cleveland. Record-breaking crowds are here this morning. We've just learned that Jimmy Doolittle has decided to try a new airplane in the speed trial. It's the GB, ladies and gentlemen. Keep your eye on the GB. I couldn't believe the uh, sensation of being around it. It seemed to be in motion as it sat there. Uh, it, it wanted to move. It wanted to go fast. It just looked like it was going to uh, do what it did to set, to set records. Uh, the attitude of the, most of the crowd was, uh, well, it can't fly. <laughs> it ain't got no wings. It ain't got no tail. How are you going to steer it? Jimmy Doolittle and his famous 770 horsepower ship. And it was a killer plane. And, and as I once said to him, I said, you know, it, uh, this plane doesn't have a center of gravity. I mean, you, it, it, was, it was. It was an engine with a little tiny wing attached and hardly any tail, so that controlling that plane took true genius. stop roll and uh, I, I realized that uh, it had to be handled with silk gloves and I did I handled it very carefully at what altitude did this thing suddenly double snap roll well, that was probably 3,000 feet why did you get in that airplane why did you fly that thing it was the fastest airplane in the world at the time airplane in the world at the time, and Doolittle set a speed record 60 miles an hour faster than the previous year's winner. 
want her to take this everybody. Hey, you're not going to put her out Well, this is the path in use. Say hello to him, Jimmy, will you please? Just hold the world, hello. Say him, tell him again. You ain't ashamed of it, are you? I'll tell him for him. Say it, Miss Thompson. Go I ahead. think he's a real pilot. One to be congratulated. He really is. After flying the GB, Doolittle discovered that press photographers had been with his wife and children, hoping to catch their faces if he crashed. He asked himself if aviation was being served or damaged by the spectacle of danger, and he decided it was time to quit racing. But the GB still fascinated other speed flyers. After I finished with it, two people flew it, and one chap flew it to uh, as far as Indianapolis. I landed in Indianapolis for fuel, turned in his suit, <laughs> and the chap that the chap that owned it was there to see what his reactions were. And the chap that owned it killed himself on the takeoff. The GB was an experiment that failed, and Doolittle was proud to be one of the few people to fly it successfully. But of all his accomplishments in those early years, and even afterward, what he is most proud of is an experiment he participated in back in 1929, an experiment that changed the very nature of aviation. Things that he has accomplished in developing this thing of aviation. I mean, just to, to, he's, he's the first man ever to make a flight completely on instruments. This means takeoff, flight to certain places, and landing completely on instruments. This had never been done before. This device proves to the pilot that his senses of direction cannot be relied upon when he is unable to see sky or earth. I shall demonstrate this to you. Which way are you turning? I'm turning right. I'm turning right. That's the instrument. Turning right. The instrument says right. I'm turning right. I'm turning right. Instrument. The instrument says right. I'm turning right. I'm stopped. The instrument says right. I'm turning left. The instrument says right. I'm turning left, the instrument says right. I'm turning left, the instrument says zero, I'm stopped. Well, I don't know whether I believe the instrument or myself in this case. There were some pilots who said, I can fly into a cloud and clouds and not worry about it. I can fly by the seat of my pants. Not true. Anyone who got into clouds eventually would have vertigo, not know which way was up, and they would spin in and kill themselves. It was one of the great barriers to reliable air transportation. And Jimmy was the one who proved that you could fly entirely blind. He practically designed the instruments that were used. He said he went to different companies and said, I want this kind of an instrument working with this kind, so that you would have an artificial horizon and you would have some idea of how you were turning, even if you couldn't see anything. And so it was a two-place aircraft, and it was very, it was given an extra size wing, so it was very stable. Um, there was another pilot involved who could see at all times, and they had a hood over Jimmy's cockpit. Then the problem was they were waiting for fog. Well, about 6 o'clock one morning, my mechanic awakened me and said, the fog we've been waiting for is in. You can hardly see your hand in front of your face. So... Uh, he, we pulled out the airplane, and I took off and made the first flight in a real zero zero fog. About that time, word had gotten to Harry Guggenheim. He said, uh, I'd like to see a blonde flight. I said, well, I'll make this one without Ben. He said, no, he said, you put Ben in there, because there may be some airplanes around. And so... Uh, uh, ben Kelsey rode in the front of the airplane and uh, with his hands up and uh, I closed the hood and took off and landed uh, with Ben Kelsey with his hands showing. The only thing I could see was my instrumentation, my instrument board. And it was lighted up electrically, like a little electric light so I could see it.
that was truly the beginning of modern commercial aviation. That's why we can fly to California overnight if necessary, or you can fly through fog. And this also was very important in flying uh, during World War II when you know, we had to do some of the flying at night. So this beginning of the whole, I think, the American aviation industry, they still use somewhat the same uh, instruments, even in uh, jet planes. There is nothing Jimmy Doolittle loved doing more than flying airplanes, and he continued to fly long after World War II. Eventually, he felt it was time to give up the pilot seat. I think if you're going to fly on bright, sunshiny days and not go anyplace, you can fly a little roughly a hundred. But if you want to fly anything, any place, any time, it has to be more a vocation than an avocation. And I was too busy to maintain that degree of competence, so I quit altogether. I suppose at the bottom of our heart, we all were anxious to see aviation take the important part in the world that it has taken. I think we all had a love of flying and a love of airplanes. 